Okay, we're going to talk about mosquito larval control, larvicides, uh, all those other things. And, and really, before I get into larvicides and stuff, um, I'm going to cover a little bit about some of the stuff that, that Janet's already talked about, Dr. McAllister. Um, probably the most important thing is, is what you've already had hammered into you, and that is we have a lot of mosquito species, over 85 in Texas, and I don't know where it's stopping, but I'm sure there's over 40, there's 40 some species at least here in the Dallas Fort Worth area, so there's quite a few, and they are all different, and you have to realize that you can't treat them all the same. They take different products, uh, take different strategies to control them in the larval stage, the adult stage. This is something you shouldn't forget. They all have different breeding sites, and that's what we're going to focus on here for a little while. And I call them breeding sites. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. I was too stupid to go grab one before I walked in here. And I've been talking for three days, so I broke it. There's a lot of other differences, but we're going to focus on the breeding sites. Really, not breeding sites, uh, it's where they choose to lay their eggs, and not breeding them. That's what they're doing in their egg deposition. So we're going to focus on some of those sites a little bit and some of the specific species. Now some of these won't be of, of real interest here. Um, I know you've already seen this. Dr. Hammer talked, touched on this, the mosquito life cycle. Where this is going to come into play later in my talk has to do with the products and the timing in which we apply those different products. Okay. The egg laying again can be done singly or perhaps. I was outside earlier, but I'm sure you've discussed this. They hatch within one to 48 hours. Um, some of them tend to lay their eggs on permanent water based on species. Some of them lay their eggs in dry areas or areas that are prone to flood. Permanent water species, flood water species. So they have different egg laying strategies. Larval stage, also called wigglers, they have four development periods called instars as they grow. I'm sure most of you are aware of that. You see them when they're, when they're first instars, they're so tiny you can barely see them. They're a little bitty, they're almost clear. You really have to know what you're looking for. Then they go into second, third, fourth instar. What's important to know is about halfway through the fourth instar, they stop feeding. And that's going to be important later in the talk. Some of the larvicides that we use require them to consume it. Okay? So we'll come back to this. But they actually have to eat some of these larvicides. I feel much better now. I don't know what that was. But they'll, they stop consuming and they do not feed in the pupil stage. So that's going to be important. A lot of them look a little bit different. Here you have the anopheles, and uh, Dr. McAllister said the anopheles do not, do not die. They don't go down for some of the plants. They go on the surface. You can see there's no siphon to them there. They float flat against the surface. I have a picture of that here in a little while. There's some Culex, here's some anteaters. And it's important to be able to identify these things. And that's actually how I got into this business. My first job, I actually had a wildlife degree and was doing avian surveillance um, for, oh, three or four years. And I had a job offer to do larval identification, larval surveillance, and I had no clue. I was not an entomologist. I had two entomology classes in college. And uh, my old boss has passed away now. He said, do you think you can do this? I said, I don't know. Give me a day or two and I'll figure it out. And so we had about 25 different larval samples in our lab. And I went in there and took out the, the larval identification key. And within two days, I could do them without the key, you know, I knew them all by heart. I said, okay, I think I can do this. So that's how I actually got into this, was through larval identification. But you're only going to have a handful of important species in this area. And if you're going to get serious with the program, and it is going to be important for you to be able to identify some of them, it doesn't take much, just a decent microscope and a little bit of patience and a key, so that you know if there's something you need to worry about, new treatments or not. The level of activity we had last year you're going to have a serious program, you're going to have to use some product. Budgets play an important role. So where you treat, where you don't treat is going to become important. And you need to know what these are, whether or not you need to actually go out to eat. 
say it again, they, they do not be that's the thing that's play here in a little while we talk about products. <clears throat> Dr. Kalster also taught, touched on synchronous and asynchronous breeding. Um, synchronous breeding you see with storm sewer, or not storm sewer, permanent, I can't even get that right, blood water species where they go and they lay their eggs and they sit like little time bombs waiting for a rainfall event, the sprinkler to go off, things like that. Those eggs will all hatch at the same time. <clears throat> Larding will all be the same size. You'll walk up to a puddle or a ditch, and all you see are the same size larvae. When you get permanent water breeders, specifically in this case, this past summer, Felix Winks, then you have asynchronous breeding. You have eggs that are laid today, eggs that are laid tomorrow, eggs that are laid the next day. So you have all stages, all sizes in that water body, and hence you have continuous mosquito production over time. Got convergence on a nightly basis. Okay, some of the standing water species. I want to touch, now some of these won't be real important. And I'm going to probably focus mostly on the wings. Uh, but these are some of the species we have. And pay attention, they have different areas. If you're going to have a program and you're going to go out and you're going to do treatments, you can't do a blind. You've got to go and do surveillance. You've got to go and look at these things, so you need to know where to find them. And these are just some examples of where we can look for these things. I apologize, this was an actu actually a talk that I had as a biology talk, so I've kind of cut out some of the stuff on adults and tried to focus just a little bit on the larvae. This is QX Wing Capacity is also known as the Southern House Mosquito. This is the one that was primarily responsible for all the activity we had with West Nile here in the Dallas Hillary during the last year. <clears throat> These are some of their egg wraps. They lay their eggs in wrap. There can be easily a couple hundred eggs in each wrap. A little wrap is about the size of a grain of rice. And the eggs are laid and glued together in a vertical fashion. When they're first laid, they're real white, and as they age over a little bit of time, for a matter of hours, they'll turn dark gray and turn black. And I would always see these in the summer in my, in my dog's water dish. It wasn't like I didn't change the water. It was always pretty clean. I, I'm changing on a daily basis, but we had such a high population and it was, it was during the summer, they were looking for anywhere to lay their eggs. I always had them in there. And if you didn't know what you were looking for, you saw little black specks floating on top of the water. Helix queens prefer highly organic water. Most people associate them with sewage because they really do like sewage. The dirtier the better, the higher the organic content, the more you're going to find really love it, it's like a pig in mud. But they're very opportunistic breeders, and I've heard Dr. McAllister say before, and thought some really good work, is cryptic. They're very cryptic breeders. They will lay their eggs everywhere. They're really hard to control by larvae siding alone, because there will be eggs a few, or a few larvae over in this container, or in that container, in this ditch. It's not like flood water species, where they're all coming from this one little bar section of ditch or one section of creek bottom. Very opportunistic breeders. They thrive during the heat when a lot of other species struggle. Uh, and they do that because they are cryptic breeders, because they will just take whatever opportunity they have. So you find them in a lot of different places. And certainly what I'm going to show you is it, it's not limited to these. I've seen them just about everywhere but the salt marsh. Okay. Now septic leaks, you're going to find them there, and that's when you see a septic leak, that's probably going to be the species that you're dealing with. But again, anywhere that has any organic content, a pet dish, and again, it doesn't have to be that dirty. I would find them after a day or two in a clean bucket for my dog. But certainly, if you get some rainfall, there's dog food in there, or cat food, that's left out for a period of time, they'll be in there. Bird baths and fountains, if they're not running, if they're not kept clean. You know, a bird will come, they'll land and they'll take their bath. What do you think the last thing they do before they fly off of this? You can only imagine. They, they leave a bomb in there. So it doesn't take long for it to get really nasty, a lot of organic content. And you'll have them in there. Now, there's a lot of other species you'll find here. You'll, you'll 
all the five container readers, they need to dip five and to allocate the same limits. So just because I've shown you pictures, don't associate with specifically one species. But you will find links in them. The green pools, um, as they said earlier, not all green pools are going to breed mosquitoes. But they can be a real problem. Uh, I was actually out in California helping a coworker on Sunday and Monday in a meeting. And they have a vendor that, that I know he helps in, in uh, I believe, Phoenix. And I know he has some customers in California. And they actually offer a service. They take care of photography and they run through filters for municipal customers and then provide maps that will go right into the GIS systems and pinpoint the green pools and the potential breeding sites. Um, we don't sell that, but he has that service. And you know, that maybe if you're successful, that might have a fit here in Dallas as legislation moves along to allow us access to some of the problem areas. But it's a service that he provides just mapping these because here's your maps, here's your electronic data points. Go get them. <clears throat> dumpsters. Now, most dumpsters don't hold water, but occasionally, if you get water, and I, I've seen this in multiple locations, you get water that stands around a dumpster. We've all seen, especially if you come back from a restaurant, you get kind of a sludge and gooey mess in some of those dumpsters, and you'll get a little bit of runoff. Have standing water that stands there for long enough. You can see the extra garbage here on top of it. You can get plants that breed in that specific area. Even though that water looks pretty, pretty clean, there's a good bit of organic content coming out of that dumpster. Also, under houses, uh, when we used to go out and do surveillance, I found quite a few larvae under houses. Now, that wasn't fun finding them. You know, get under here and treat it like you're doing a termite job. But you always have a pipe leaking, especially with. In older parts of town, the elevated housing, you've got pipes that leak, um, and it's very dark underneath there, and that water will just sit. It doesn't evaporate. Mm. And ditches, sometimes you find them in some, some you don't. But you can see this, you see all the grass clippings that have been going in this ditch. And you know, a lot of people, when they make the, uh, the water for the gravity traps, are using grass clippings. Right as an attractant, they stew it in there. So <clears throat> this is no different than a gravity trap, except you're not traveling; you're just attracting them when they're in. Now, I Underground storm drains. This is one that's hard to locate, but for, I did years and years worth of Felix Quink's collections for disease surveillance in Houston, and I could probably take you back to about a half a dozen areas that are probably still popping mosquitoes, you pull the lid and there'd be three, four, five thousand mosquitoes come out of that lid at you. And they were about 50% male, 50% female. And you know what that means when you're getting about half and half? You're right there at the breeding source, usually. There's a lot that goes under, on under the streets. As they put them in, when they originally put them in, they're level and they drain, right? over time you get settled, especially down by the Gulf Coast. There you get a little bit of it up here too. Plus you get some stoppage in there. During the heat of the summer when we don't get good flushing from rainfall, especially like our summers, we get dry period. You get trash down there, it gets really stagnant. This can be a really good hidden area for them for a production area. You get a lot of them. And there's no way for us to see that, but it does occur. <clears throat> really hard area to control. And really, about the only thing you can do is if you can pinpoint an area that's potentially ULB some of the products down in there, some of the larvae stuff. And it's tough. That's tough to do. Uh, it's hard to actually get the material down into some of these some of these areas down through the pipes. But that's really about your only alternative. Water leaks. This is fairly clean water, but again, when there's not a lot of Egg laying sites around during the summer, they're very opportunistic. You will find them anywhere you have water. They're not going to be the most common species you find in tire. Usually, Albopictus or Egypti, but you will find them in tire. Not in great numbers, but they'll be in that. There's some tires that have been there. They're in the shade. Tires are in full sun, normally they get hot enough, you won't have a lot of production in them. But if you get a little bit of shade on them, they stay cool. If you get enough algae in there, Twinks will be in there. 
Election buckets and orange green against fountains. You can see this one's got a pretty green tag. Got some algae growth in there. A lot of different areas. So don't limit yourself to where you look for Felix Clinton's Different species of anomalies. These lay their eggs singly on standing water. They overwinter as blood fed females. Not that it matters if we're talking about larvicide, but there's an identifying characteristic of the anopheles in the genus anopheles. Robostis in the pouch are of equal length. Dr. Callister said you can't effectively control anopheles with BPI. You can see anopheles larvae have no cycle down there, so when they float, they look like little sticks. Most larvae kind of float up and down, kind of at an angle to the surface of the water. When you see one that's floating like a little stick flat on the surface of the water, that's, that's a, a genus anopheles. And they don't really dive down to B. And like she said, BTI, it quickly settles down through the water column and doesn't stay up the top. So it's one consideration if you're training anopheles. You'll find them in freshwater swamps. You'll also find them in uh, areas with high vegetation, some duck weed, things like that. And now, highly associated with aquatic vegetation. You'll also see some of the species, especially quads, uh, quadrimaculatus in rice fields. You see just a zillion of them in rice fields. You'll see crucians in our salt marshes during the winter months. You'll see in Tornada. I don't know that that's a real big species up here. We get quite a few in the fall and winter months down along the coast. There are species that prefer to feed on large, large mammals. So lay their eggs in pastures, hoof prints, tire tracks, things like that, in pastures where they're real close to large mammals. They'll first feed on cattle, horses, things like that. So you'll find them in the, in the fall and winter months in areas like this. Genus Mansonia and genus Coplatidia, they're really an oddball. Uh, this is a slide I've used before. Some of you have probably seen that. They don't actually come up to the surface to breathe there. It's like the old westerns where the guy dives down and stick the straw up through there and suck in air. That's how they breathe. They have a little a little uh, serrated portion right here on the, the tip of the cycle. And they actually can embed themselves into emergent vegetation. Vegetation that's growing at the bottom and actually coming out and uh, they're getting their oxygen supply through there. So they will spend their entire life as a as a uh, larvae right there attached to the vegetation. So you won't actually see them on the surface. You can dip and you won't find them. Unless you pull up the vegetation, shake it off, scrape them off, you won't even know they're there. It's really hard to find. But they're highly, highly associated with emergent vegetation. You can see where the water line was on this one. So they're going to be embedded right in there. Okay, floodwater species. Um, these are ones, again, that lay their eggs in areas that are prone to flood. Okay? They don't actually lay their eggs on the water surface. Now, you think of, there's a couple of them that I wouldn't associate with flood waters, and that is container breeders. Okay? The Gentai and Albuquerque's. Because we see them in containers. They think, well, they're laying their eggs in the water in the container. They're actually laying their eggs just above the water line on the side of the container. And when the sprinkler goes off, you get rainfall and water level comes up and those eggs hatch. We're going to touch on a few of the uh, floodwater species along the coast. This is one of the biggest, 80 solicitans, the old salt marsh mosquito. They prefer brackish water, uh, intertidal areas, just a zillion acres along the coast for these things to breed. And I, I personally, I've been in the marsh where you could park the grass. They wouldn't be out in the open water. If you get the, the, the grassy areas like this, you can walk in and park the grass, and you can almost walk across them, and you can look. You can say, okay, there's 10,000 acres, there's 10,000 acres, there's 10,000 acres, there's 10,000 acres. I'm looking across 40 or 50,000 acres of bloody grassland, and I park the grass, and they're all, you can almost walk across them. And they're all going to come off within a day or two of each other and fly off. So, do you really want to be there when that emergence happens? No, you can't breathe. These tenuricus, they are also a brackish water breeder, you find them along the coast. 
we have lesser numbers in Texas than we do solicitans, but they still are a very important species along the coast. They're very aggressive as well. Breeding primarily the same areas as the solicitans. Triceriatus, maybe triceriatus, vector of lacrosse. We do have them here, and occasionally we've had a case of lacrosse here and there. Um, not human cases, but we come up with mosquito positive. Do you know, I don't know that we actually had a human cases here in recent years. I've heard there's been some, I heard the state health advocate, it might have been here. So I don't know if I heard that. I'm aware of positive mosquitoes, but not human cases. Yeah, they tend to be more Appalachia classic, yeah. higher altitude cases. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
if I'm not mistaken. Prophesied essence. Got those here as well. Herox, primarily a woodland species. We've got those. Columbia. Not so many of those up here, I assume. We have plenty along the coast. Although I haven't seen very many. We just have lots and lots of them. I don't see near as many on an unofficial survey. And we used to just get them by the billions, but now they're kind of, kind of rare. I think we've had the agriculture calm down a little bit. Hawks Reef Coyotes, I think you touched on those earlier. Um, they are not a blood feeder, but uh, they actually uh, are predacious on other mosquito larvae. And you can see here's one that's a uh, how big it is, but it's not a fourth end star, this is the fourth over here. Uh, this is probably a second or third end star. It's eating another mosquito larvae, and even though it's not full grown, it's quite a bit bigger. It eats it all the way down to the head capsule and bites the head off the head this thing. That's where they get all their protein to produce their eggs is by consuming other mosquitoes. Okay, those are just a few of the sites that we're going to find in this. Okay? How do you find those sites? Unless you can really afford some, some expensive aerial photography and things like that, you're going to have to pull on your dang rubber boots, put on your short, short sleeve shirt or pellet, and you're going to have to find either get out for yourself or find some poor sucker that's lower on the boat pole than you that can get out with, or hire Patrick and Mike to get out there. You know. It's not an easy task, especially when you're looking for clicks, because again, they're creepy. They, they're everywhere. So you have to spend your time afield to find them. Okay, so we found a few. This is this is kind of like the aerial maps that they'll provide that one company, and they'll actually have points here. They'll have a point there, and they'll have the names, and then give you uh, give you a link on it, format or maps. So what are we going to do? We've got several choices, and some of this covers what Dr. McAllister covered earlier. We've got source reduction methods we can use, biological controls, mechanical controls, and chemical controls. I won't touch too much on source reduction and biological since you've already talked about it. Source reduction is simply just getting rid of the sources. It's not permanent. It is fairly inexpensive. Manpower doesn't cost that much, unless it's you out there doing it. <clears throat> but you're out there turning over stuff, cleaning out stuff, getting rid of stuff, regrading ditches doing whatever you can to reduce the number and amount of breeding sources that they may, they may Getting rid of them. Problem is, I know years ago, and I'm sure nothing's changed since I've been gone, as soon as you clean up one tire pile, it's right back within a week, right? That's really tough. So I, I know it hasn't changed since then. That's a couple people shaking their heads at us how it is. Certainly far from permanent. And getting the homeowner to clean up this mess. If they let it get like that, the chances are they really don't care. They just want you to solve their problem for you. They're probably not going to get out there and pick it up. The best thing you could do is actually throw a match at it, call it a fire. <laughs> so, a lot of these, you know, it's nice to think that we can do something, but so much of it is up to homeowners to reduce their own problems, and they're just, a lot of times, they're not going to. There are a few that if you educate them, they'll get out there and they'll do something about it. You know, and that's why most education programs are actually aimed at kids, because the kids will actually listen and they're not old and fat like me, and they'll actually get out there and do something. Oh, hey, we'll try to this button. <coughs> Things like urns, the old urns, the cemetery you can fill the stand, tree holes you can fill the stand. Yeah, it's not always permanent picture of this. And I know uh, the Corps of Engineers used to actually do some of this back when I was in application. We did quite a bit of surveillance on the Houston Ship Channel, the dredge pool area. And what they would do is they would pump these areas, pull the dredge, eight or ten feet of dredge, and let it settle for two or three years, enough they could get the equipment out there, and then they'd ditch it so it would drain off better. Other examples, filling landscape depressions, cleaning out gutters, regrading ditches. Et cetera, et cetera. Again, this is not permanent. It takes manpower. Biological controls, again, this was touched on a number of different ways. Um, one thing I will add, I know there's a few people in this room that deal with the illusion. Okay? 
Some folks out in California have gotten really serious. There's a company out there, and I don't remember the name. They've installed several systems in some of the districts that have multiple tanks. And he had one at the show that was probably all from myself to the podium long and about, I don't know, six feet wide. It was actually an Ambuja breeding container. And it had different chambers. If you moved them along as they got older, it would actually have a little rearing chamber that would suck the young up and out and put them in a different section so they wouldn't get eaten. And they were actually selling some. Some of the districts have installed these big systems over there with multiple tanks just to breed uh, Ambuja. Control. <clears throat> Method of mechanical control, you know, screening these. As Dr. McAllister said, eventually the screen is going to get ripped and then you just, you just got hundreds of them coming out every evening. But at least encourage homeowners to, to uh, screen these things off. Okay, chemical control. Several things. In marble control, we have not a lot of choices of classes. We have a lot of choices of actual products. Oils and surfactants, and oil or surfactant is something that you put on the water surface. Does anybody know what, why you put it on the surface, what it does? It smothers them, okay? Mosquito larvae, what do they breathe? Yes, they breathe air. Okay. They have a, some of them have a set of what they call aquatic gills, and I'm not an entomologist, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But they're usually non-functioning, isn't that right? Right, they're not, they're not, they're not really, okay. they're not gills. They breathe air just like you and I do. So they can't, they can stay submerged for a little while, but they've got to come back up. They have to breathe. And that cycle has to be able to come out and then they take a breath of air. A surfactant is an oil or a long chain alcohol. When you put it out, it spreads itself over the surface. And they actually, they come up and it, creates a film, and they're trying to poke up and they can't breathe and they smother. The good thing about this is, is it will kill all mosquito larvae, and it will, it will kill some beneficial insects, not all of them, but it will kill the air breathers. Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, especially the, the monomolecular films will actually suck in some of the adults if they come to lay the eggs. Now, I'm going to say some things about this. I, I will, like Dr. McAllister, I'll put out my disclaimer. I am a vendor, and I do sell some of these products. And there are going to be some names in here, but I have names of some of the stuff I sell, some of the stuff other people sell. And there's going to be positive and negatives. Um, I'm going to have positives about everybody's and negatives about everybody. So this isn't meant to sell you. I just want to have some facts about some of these different products that are available. Biologicals, biorationals, those are your bacterials and your insect growth regulators. I'm going to go through these. You have some that are actual toxins or what's considered a traditional pesticide. Okay, why are we putting out larvicides? Well, generally they're more deceptive. The majority of them are less toxic than a traditional pesticide. There, a lot of them will actually target mosquitoes or mosquitoes and maybe black flies, um, but only a handful of aquatic insects will be targeted for most of these products. So they're not very broad spectrum insecticides. So we're not doing a lot of damage to other, to other insects and other aquatics when we use these things. Unlike adulticides, if we put out an adulticide, it's a pretty broad, broad spectrum. Okay, if bees happen to be flying around, we're going to kill bees. Okay? Um, the good thing is we're usually not flying with bees around. But most of the larvicides are, are fairly narrow spectrum insecticides. If you can get to certain areas, you can get more bang for your buck. Can't fly away, they can't run away, they're trapped there in the water. So you can kill them right there. <clears throat> Usually less time consuming and a better success rate because they can't get away. Okay, oils and surfactants. We have two things. We have barbicide and oils. There's several on the market. There's BBA. Um, I'm not sure if Golden Bear is on right now. A lot of you recognize the name Golden Bear. Uh, there's Bonine. There's a new one out called Cocoa Bear. Um, not sure it doesn't have coconut oil in it, but it's called cocoa there. Um, then there's also monomolecular films. The large side oils are actually, oops, are actually oils. The monomolecular films are a long chain alcohol. Um, the benefit with the large side oil, 
does, it does kill all mosquitoes, it kills all stages, even the pupae. Even the pupae have to breed, uh, breed, excuse me, not breed. So it'll kill them all, no matter what, what stage they are. Um, the model of your film will do the same thing. Um, here, you don't get a lot of vegetation burning. Here you will. However, the positives for an MMF are is that you're using a smaller amount and it spreads itself a lot better. They both end up doing the same thing. They're going to actually smother them, keep them from breathing, and it will kill first in stars through the forest and kill the pupae. There's not a lot of choices if you have a lot of pupae uh, as a method of control. The bacterials, the main one is BTI, the original one. Bacillus thuringiensis is real And this is, this is actually not a live bacteria, it's produced from bacteria. I've been up to the, the Vela facilities, and what used to be uh, the Abbott, Abbott Laboratory run facilities in Chicago. It's really interesting how they make the, uh, they brew it like beer. And you, you get really thirsty when you go in their, in their production facility. Because this smells like they're brewing, and they are. They've got these big vats that are like three or four stories tall. And you can walk up and look down in them, and they have little stirs, and it's just like brewing beer. But they're raising these bacteria, uh, culturing them. Once they produce them, they harvest them, and then there are certain toxins within them that they actually uh, harvest those toxins to produce these products. There's quite a few products with BTI. Traditionally, BTI is only a seven or ten day product, very broad range, um, as far as the number of species it will, will kill, mosquito wise. There's a number of different products. Lately, the trend has been to actually formulate those things into residual products that give you anywhere from three to four weeks or even more. That's been the trend. So you've got um, make the back, which is a, a liquid and a granule. This was originally a seven day material. Again, the trend has been to go more towards longer residual. And the way they're doing this is formulating in, in media that holds it and does a time release. Uh, you have four star briquettes. Central Life Science just bought four star briquettes and they're now overseeing the production. That's a time release product. And then you also have uh, sustained from all pro. It's a multi coated granule because of time release. That's been the trend. Bacillus spiritus, this is actually produced, you've got a live bacteria that will replicate once it's put in the water in vector uh, And the other one is spiritax, the two more products on the market. And then you have spinosad. Uh, spinosad is, is, a, is bacterial derived. And Dr. Kowski, I noticed you had it under an IGR earlier. Yeah, I'm not sure it doesn't have an IGR effect, right? Okay. I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. But it is a bacterial produced thing. Um, um, this will kill all stages. These, have, these two have to be consumed. So the only thing, that, the only time it's going to work is on first through third in star larvae. So timing is important with these products. Spinosad not so much. However, spinosad is a broad spectrum. It will kill all aquatic insects. So even though you don't have to worry about timing as much, you have to, you have to worry about beneficial effects. Bacteria primarily work as a stomach poison, although spinosad, I, I believe, will also work as a contact. Insect growth regulators, um, there's only primarily one on the market. Those are the Alpha Sid line of products. I'm going the wrong way. Alpha Sid line of products, a bunch of different formulations. An insect growth regulator, it acts as a mimic of what's called juvenile hormone. And without going into a long, drawn out thing, it affects the way they grow, they grow and develop as larvae. So it doesn't not like kill them, but it affects their growth and they end up not emerging as adult mosquitoes. Um, very environmentally friendly product. It's been around quite a while, still shows great success. Toxicants, uh, there's two on the market that I'm aware of. They're both Timofos, which is an organophosphate, that's Provec and Aven. Again, these are kind of broad spectrum. You don't have to worry about timing. Bad thing is, Timofos will kill non targets. So you have to be very careful. You don't want to use it in a sensitive situation. You don't want to use it if you have fish. 
If you have a lot of different visuals that you want to save, you don't want to use it there. Um, it will work very well, but you just want to watch your application. The other thing is, if you're using organophosphate as your adult side, you don't want to be pounding them on both ends, both as larvae and as adults, with the same class of chemical. So, if you're using organophosphate either for pyrifos or malphon, you probably wouldn't want to be using chemifos as uh, as a larvae. Factors to consider again: timing. Certain ones, uh, specifically the insect growth regu regulators and the bacterials. What I did mention on, on alcid, there's also a timing. They have to be able to absorb enough of it. So again, primarily first through in third instar larvae. Once they get to fourth instar, you're not going to see as much success. So you really have to watch your timing with alcid and with bacterials. Now, the good thing is those are both products that are very friendly. Okay, won't hit many non-targets, but you do have to watch your timing. You have to consider whether you have access, either legal or physically. Um, you know, obviously a lot of you guys are going to be putting briquettes and storm sewers, things like that. It's real easy to walk up, no problem with access. Some of you might be treating ditches or little ponds that you can walk up to. Some of you might have areas like this that you can't even pack your way into. This is one of our old dredge pole areas, um, or a dredge pole area, like the ones we used to have up in Houston. Um, Again, they would flood these things with eight or ten foot of, of, of sludge and then let it sit there for two or three years before they went in there and did anything. And what it would do is form a crust. And I've got, you know, I'm running out of time, but I've got a quick story. The guy that took my place, I used to go out and, and look for these areas and call in aerial treatments with larvicide about the four and years. And the guy that took my place, he was either a lot braver than me or a lot stupider, I'm not sure. But, what happens is you go out on these areas, they'll form a crust over time. And you feel it's kind of spongy. I'm like, oh, I'm good. I'm not seeing or anything. I'm not good. It's just there's an inch or two of water you're walking out there, and then you break through. You get out there about 50 feet, and then you break through the crust. And down you go. And that is the nastiest, yuckiest, stinkiest, greasiest stuff down in there. Well, he decided that he could buy some of these things, I don't know what they're called, but they have these little flaps. Put them on your boots. And when you, every time you step down, these little sets of wings go out. So it, it kind of spreads out your boots and decreases the PSI that you're putting down. It allows you to walk on really soft areas. So he got smart and he bought one of these. And I wasn't there to watch it. And he walked out there and they called him, he called them his Jesus shoes because he could walk on water. And he went way out there. But guess what? He found he found a soft spot. And what I was told, he went up to about here. And they had to throw him a rope to get him out. He almost died with his Jesus shoes. <laughs> so you, you need, you know, access will determine how much you can physically do with the site. Some of it you just you're not going to be able to get to a treat on a uh, on a reasonable basis. There's lots of different formulations between the products. Um, Alphacid alone has seven. There's liquids. Corn cob granules, there's sand granules, there's dispersible granules, there's multiple kinds of briquettes, um, there's water soluble packets which use pellets or, or granules in them. Um, they're all meant for specific water types, specific species, specific types of treatments, you know, depending on what equipment you have. So just, I can't, I couldn't begin to cover them all in a two or three hour talk. But just know that they're all available. The best thing you can do is do your research, ask questions, talk to me if you're buying from me, if you're buying from somebody else, ask them their advice. But there's a lot of different larvicides, and they are meant for specific situations. Each location, each species that you're dealing with, each water type is going to have an ideal product. If you're not using that product, uh, then you're probably not going to be controlled that you could otherwise. So ask a lot of questions, pick your product accordingly. Here's two different types of granules. There's a corn cob granule, there's a sand-based granule, coated sand granule. Briquettes, there's difference in briquettes. There's little briquettes, there's big briquettes. Uh, there's donuts. Um, these are meant to be used like briquettes in water-soluble packets. 
actually go through the office and help them. Um, they even have ing ingot briquettes. They're long and narrow. I think I have a picture right here. Do you think a briquette's a briquette? Well, some of them are 30 days, some are 150 days, some are, I think there's 180 days. There's multiple lengths that they're, they're good for. Um, there's an ingot briquette. There's two different kinds of Alpha Sin 150 day briquettes. There's this long, skinny one, and then there is this big round one right here. They're both 150 days, both the same vacuum. Why is one long and skinny and one short and fat? Right. The original ones were short and fat. Okay. At some point, somebody said, well, we can't get these big ones through this storm grain. It won't fit, so we're just going to break it up. Well, when you break it up, it's not going to last 150 days anymore. So, they made the ingot briquettes that can fit down to the storm grains. So, there's all different things. You just have to find the right one to fit your situation. And sometimes, you have to use what fits your equipment. I mean, there's liquid applications. There's in briquette applications. You can use backpacks to dry to uh, blow dry products out, to blow liquid products out. There's a BGI that is, that is designed, I don't know how well it works, I haven't seen it uh, tested yet myself, but it's designed to be fogged out of equipment. Uh, typical liquid application. And there's aerial applications. Main takeaway point, there's lots of species of mosquito larvae. Uh, they're all different. Uh, the methods and products that we use to control them should be different accordingly. There's no single method or product that will work well for all situations. So talk to your distributor and ask. Ask questions. Ask somebody if you don't know. Ask somebody that doesn't know. So there's lots of resources we have here in Texas. If you need resources outside of myself, there's Dr. Taylor, there's Dr. Mark Johnson in College Station. Um, there's quite a few distant directors around the state that are willing to help out that you can call them and they answer your questions. Michael, you have a question? Most of the products that we use in stock and water are labeled to be in the text number square C, which is in the search matter. Is there a city rule of thumb for depth, volume, that sort of thing? On the back, the question was that a lot of the products like briquettes and water soluble packets that are meant to be used for small areas like catch basins are usually, they usually say for treatment of 50 square feet or 100 square feet. And he asked if, that, if depth makes a difference. On bacterial products, no, they're products that are consumed. And when it says 50 square feet, it's 50 square feet. It really doesn't matter the depth. Now depth will have some impact on it, but as far as your application, no. Now, without the SID products, Alphacid products go into suspension in the water. They're actually absorbed and not consumed. So your goal is to achieve a certain amount of product, a certain concentration in the water. So the deeper the water, the lower the concentration is. So yes, Alphacid products specifically, if it says 100 square feet for a briquette, that's 100 square feet up to two feet of depth. For every additional two feet of depth, you would put another briquette. So if it's four feet, would put two briquettes per hundred square feet. If it's six feet deep, you would put three per hundred square feet. Yes, you would have to come up with a calculation because you know they're they have a gradient, they're deeper on one end, so you would have to take an average. But yes, you would have to you would have to do a little math because it does matter on, on an IGR. The deeper you in here? Yes. Is that all correct what I just said? Yes, sir. I want to make sure it's straight out of the horse's mouth. Anybody else have any questions? Yes. Mike, you talked to me about the product specifically for pupae treatment. Specifically for treatment of pupae? Well, you would have to use one of two things. You would either have to use uh, Timofos or you would have to use one of the surfactants. Okay? Because pupae don't feed, uh, they do have to breathe, which is why surfactant would work. Um, they don't feed. And so the bacterials will not work. Um, there's not enough time for them to absorb enough of the methoprene, which is an alphacid, or to keep them from emerging. Uh, so you've got to either use something that's going to outright kill them, which is an organophosphate, tenofos, either probate or abate, or you have to use an oil or a monomolecular panel in order to kill them. 
it's your 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 options are really limited once you have a lot of people. All right. Thank y'all very much. Appreciate it.